So I want to tell all of you a story today. And that story began six and a half years ago when I was a first year medical student at this very medical school. Uh, the building wasn't nearly as nice. Uh, but I went to my white coat ceremony. And my parents came, and it was a very exciting moment. Uh, it was especially exciting for my mother, who's a physician, uh, and who's the daughter and granddaughter of a physician. And I come from a family of about 35 doctors. And so this was a great moment for me and for my family. And uh, you know, I, I started med school optimistic. I wanted to change the world like all medical students wanted to do. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with my life, but I was hopeful and excited. And I felt so privileged and honored to be uh, able to have this experience. And so I started medical school, and I started to sit through classes and lectures, and uh, we went through the whole first year curriculum. And as I sat in those classes and I started to learn about medicine, my excitement started to turn into frustration. And that frustration was driven by the fact that we were spending a lot of time learning about disease, the pathophysiology of disease. We were learning about how an acute uh, rupture of uh, atherosclerotic plaque uh, could cause it an MI. And we were learning about insulin resistance and how that leads to diabetes. And I started to think about why are we learning about the pathophysiology of disease and then how to treat that disease and not spending much time on what is the cause of the disease? And what is what's been called the cause of the cause, the root cause of these diseases? And I started to think about the idea that heart disease and diabetes are plaguing our nation. There's a huge burden of disease that we face as a country. And we were really focusing so much on uh, treatment and not prevention. So I became obsessed with this idea of the fact that these diseases, these often fatal diseases, uh, were not only preventable but actually reversible. And so I said, let me do some research on this and figure out what's going on. How did we end up in this place that we're at? And so like any good student, I went and I started to, to look things up and I found some really interesting but obvious information. And I found out that the disease burden, heart disease, diabetes, was being driven by an unhealthy lifestyle, our collective unhealthy lifestyle, our behaviors that were putting us in this position. <laughs> oh, skip it. So, uh, and so Dr. Rena Wing came and she showed us the famous CDC obesity slides. And she talked to us about how obesity was on the rise across the nation uh, to the point where two thirds of all of us, two out of three Americans are overweight or obese. And she talked to us about how 60 diseases and counting have been linked to obesity. Two thirds of all diabetes is associated with obesity. Two thirds of all heart disease is associated with obesity. And some of the leading forms of cancer are also associated with obesity. And so I wanted to figure out how did we get here in the first place? And so I did research and some of the answers were obvious. And you saw the first slide, you know, this is how we exercise, which is to say that we don't exercise. And in fact, 90% of us, 90% of the people in this room probably don't exercise on a regular basis. And we've adopted behaviors that, if we step back and thought about them, would probably embarrass us, ourselves. Uh, we, we take the elevator to the second floor, even when we're perfectly capable of walking, taking the stairs. When we go to the grocery store, we get consumed by road rage, fighting for the parking space right next to the door, when we can easily park 10 spots away and walk. And so I said, obviously, we have a sedentary lifestyle. But what's the other half of the equation? The other half of the equation is that we eat like this. And we've, we have to live in a society where bigger is better. The bigger your car, the better. The bigger your house, the better. The more food that you can pile on your plate at the old country buffet, the better. And we've become so addicted to eating high calorie, unhealthy, fast food, and we're so lazy that we won't even get out of our car to get that food. We'll actually drive through the restaurant and have somebody <laughs> hand it to us as we sit in the driver's seat. And I started to think about, okay, well, there's a lot of personal decisions that are being made, and, and we've adopted this unhealthy lifestyle, but what's happening on a national level? And what about national leadership? And it turns out that we've had historically very poor national leadership. We live in a society where ketchup and pizza are considered vegetables, as far as school lunches are concerned. We live in a society where physical education is being cut out of the curriculum so we can spend more time teaching to the test. We live in a society where the CDC spends 11% of its budget on health promotion and chronic disease prevention, when 75% of all deaths are caused by chronic disease. And the odds are stacked against us when we think about marketing. We live in a society where McDonald's spends $500 million a year telling us that they love to see us smile, 
and the federal government builds $3 million telling us that when it comes to fruits and vegetables, more matters. And then I started to learn about the fact that we were taking adult diseases and moving them down the age spectrum. So what we used to call adult onset diabetes, we now just call type 2 diabetes, because you can be 10, year, 10 years old and have it. And there are now case reports of teenagers having triple and quadruple bypass surgeries, lifestyle related. And that data point frightened me, and it should probably frighten you. And as I was doing all this research and becoming passionate about prevention and trying to understand the root cause of all this, I began to see patients in the clinic during our doctoring course. And I noticed three things in those patients that sparked my imagination. The first thing I found out was that almost every single patient had a goal to improve their health, whether it was to eat better, to increase their exercise, to lose weight, to lower their blood pressure, lower their cholesterol, bring down their A1C, whatever it was, everybody wanted to improve. The second thing I learned was that almost everybody was failing at making those improvements. Not for lack of trying, but they would come back to their physician's office three, six, 12 months later, and they had failed at losing a few pounds, at, at sticking to their exercise regimen. And this was frustrating not just for the patient, but also for the whole healthcare community. And the third thing I found out was that once in a while there was a patient who succeeded. We saw a patient who came back and they had lost 20 and 30 pounds. They had lowered their cholesterol and their blood pressure. Sometimes we'd be able to take them off their medications. And I started to talk to those patients, and I asked them what they did differently. What made them successful while everybody else was failing? And they all said the same exact thing. They said, I didn't do it alone. They did very simple but powerful things, like they joined a gym with an exercise partner, and that person held them accountable. They went on a diet with a group of friends, and those people cheered them on. They changed the way that they ate as a family, and they were able to modify their environment and their culture. And I became fascinated by that simple and intuitive but very, very powerful idea. These people not only had the motivation and support they needed, but they also had the accountability. And so the concept I stumbled upon, if I had to sum it up in three words, is really this idea of better health together. If we go it alone, we fail. But if we work together, we're so much more likely to succeed. And I started to think, you know, we treat health as private and personal, and especially obesity, which is often driven by individual behaviors, we treat that as an individual problem. What if obesity actually isn't an individual problem based on a lack of individual responsibility? What if it's actually a social problem that's resulted from a lack of social responsibility? And if that's true, then that calls upon all of us to figure out how to come together to solve this social problem in a social way. And the more I thought about it, the more intoxicated I became with this idea. And I realized that if this is true, if obesity is a social disease, then we need to spend less time researching and trying to figure out how to create one of these. And we needed to spend more time researching and figuring out how to understand this. And what this is here is a social network map with body mass index of the people in that social network map overlaid on top of it. And the, the green dots are the body mass index. The darker the green dot, the, the heavier the person. And this is a map that we use to understand how people are connected. Who's in the center of the network? Who's in the periphery of the network? Who has more connections? Who has fewer connections? How are the people with heavier weights clustering and what's happening. And so I wanted to, to understand this. And I decided that this was the idea that I was going to pursue. I wanted to leverage social networks to help people achieve their health outcomes. And so what I decided to do uh, as an ambitious first year medical student is I wanted to create a statewide campaign. I wanted to help people exercise and lose weight. Uh, but I knew that if we just use this group-based behavior change model that's used by Alcoholics Anonymous and Weight Watchers, we could help people, but it wouldn't be fun and it wouldn't be engaging. So to make it fun, we turned it into a competition. We decided that people were not only going to have a team, but those teams were going to compete. They were going to compete to see who could lose the most weight, who could walk the highest number of steps, who could exercise the highest number of minutes. So I got together with my friend uh, Ray Rickman, who's in the audience here. And Ray and I uh, decided to create a nonprofit organization. He also thought this was a great idea. We built this nonprofit organization called Shape Up Rhode Island. We designed a logo. And we hired some developers in India to put together a little platform for us. And the platform would allow people to build their team and communicate with their team, set goals, track their progress, uh, to be able to see how their team was doing. It was a social platform uh, in the days when there weren't really a lot of social platforms. 
And we went out and we tried to raise money and we really hit a wall. Uh, nobody really wanted to fund a new idea uh, that was being spearheaded by a medical student. And so we had this platform, we had this idea, we had this vision, and we had no money to get the word out. And so we did what really anybody who would uh, an idea that they were passionate about would do, and that's we started to spam people. <laughs> and so we put together every name and email address we could, our friends, family, anybody in Rhode Island, we rented lists, we stole lists, and we started spamming people. And we started asking them to join this program. We said, we have an idea. If we work together to improve our health, we can all be more successful. So let's try that. And our goal was to get 200 people in this program. That was, that was the goal. It was a small project. We said, can we get... Uh, 200 people. And so we, we put these emails out, and really that's when the magic started to happen. We ended up getting 200 people uh, in the program. What was fascinating is those 200 people signed up to be team captains. They signed up as individuals who would take it upon themselves to go out and to recruit their friends, their family, and their colleagues. And so those 200 people turned into 2,000 people. And those 2,000 people came together and started to exercise and lose weight. And the idea proved popular. The mechanism was so viral. People were getting their social network involved in things that they would never dream of doing. And Ray and I were thrilled. We fell out of our seats. We said, wow, 2,000 people signed up for this idea. We're onto something. This is amazing. We're celebrating. And then it dawned on us that we had promised these 2,000 people one of these. <laughs> and that meant we had to package and ship 2,000 of these pedometers out, um, which was an absolute nightmare. Uh, but our excitement remained, and uh, it was not just individuals that, that became uh, enamored with this idea. It was also employers. And so Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island and Citizens Bank and CVS Caremark started to call us. And they said, hey, can we pay for our employees to be in this program? We're trying to reduce our health care costs. We want to engage our employees, healthier employees and more productive employees. Can we pay you and put our employees in? And we said, absolutely. And so we opened the program to employers. And the next time we offered it, 7,000 people signed up. The next time we offered it, 11,000 people signed up, and then 15,000 people signed up. And they came from all 39 towns and cities, people from every nook and cranny of the state. They came from places like small businesses, and they came from large companies. They came from uh, places where they work in basements, and uh, they came from families. Um, they came from hospitals came from community centers, they came from schools, they came from uh, fitness facilities, and they even came from places where apparently everybody was on hallucinogenic drugs. <laughs> uh, but the point is that they came, and we didn't know these people, we had no idea who they were. They heard about it through word of mouth, they were enamored with the idea. Somebody invited them to be a part of the program. It was truly viral. They heard about it from a friend, and that's how they got engaged in this program. And so when we look at the participation of all these teams, we've been doing this now for six years, uh, the numbers turn out to be pretty remarkable. 10,000 teams have signed up and participated in the program uh, from all across Rhode Island. And those teams, because they have to have a certain number of people, ended up representing 70,000 participants. And because we live in such a small state, those 70,000 participants equal 10% of the adult population. <laughs> and not only did people engage with the program in droves, but the results that they achieved were remarkable. And what happened is that the success stories started to pour in. This is actually a success story that came to me yesterday. This is a woman who's participating in our program, and over the last eight months, she's lost 55 pounds. And she said, I've transformed my life thanks to the social support. And the stories roll in all the time. People losing 30, 40, 50 pounds for the first time in their life losing any amount of weight. There are people who write to us and say, I, I walked my first 5K. And people who say, I ran my first 5K. There are people who say, I ran my first marathon. Or I'm training for an Ironman. I had one gentleman who came up to me in tears and he said, you know, I, I feel so bad. I only lost 10 pounds in your program. He said, you know that 10 pounds took 40 pounds of pressure off my knees. And for the first time in 10 years, I was able to get out of my wheelchair and walk. But people who write to us and said, you know, I was going to get knee surgery because of the pain in my knees, but I started to walk and exercise, and that pain is now gone. And I'm going to avoid that knee surgery. 
with people who lower their blood pressure, lower their LDL, lower their A1C, with people who reverse their diabetes and go off their metformin. And we have doctors who call us and say, what are you doing? You know, how did this happen? You know, these patients I've been trying to work with to get them to lose weight for so long, finally were able to transform their lifestyle. And I wanted to know what the magic was. And so we started to look at the outcomes and what the numbers were. The, the success stories were great, but what did the numbers look like? And it turns out that the reported outcomes were pretty astounding. We estimated about 300,000 pounds had been lost in the program. And to give you a point of comparison, that's the weight of 150 Volkswagen Beetles. Um, and people in the program have walked 25 billion steps. To put that into perspective, 25 billion steps is 12.6 million miles. And to give you a sense of the magnitude, that's 500 times around the world, around the Earth, at the equator, that Rhode Islanders together have walked. And then the media began to cover this. Uh, and, and there were shocking headlines in Rhode Island that we never thought we'd see. How many Rhode Islanders are in the room? There's a few. So some of you may have seen these headlines. The rest of you probably didn't. But we saw headlines like, you know, Rhode Islanders vote to change the official state drink from coffee milk to skim milk. <laughs> never thought I'd see that headline. We saw headlines like, the Cardi brothers are urging Rhode Islanders to go out and buy a new bicycle. <laughs> and my personal favorite, Dunkin' Donuts no longer serving donuts. <laughs> well, this movement, uh, as, obviously as you can tell, these are facetious headlines, but this movement really did create a buzz. Um, and it started to feel like you couldn't walk down the street without bumping into somebody who had their shape up wristband on, and had their pedometer, and wanted to show off how many steps they had walked. And we started to wonder, you know, this really feels like there's a buzz happening, and there are all these stories, but is this just hype? Did we just create the, the best marketing campaign there ever was? Um, and are people just reporting that they lost weight? Uh, maybe there's a few success stories, but really, um, are there clinical outcomes? And so I teamed up with the best person uh, in, in the world, really, to help us answer that question, and that was Dr. Wing. And Dr. Wing is the world's foremost weight loss and weight loss maintenance researcher. She was the lead investigator on the diabetes prevention program trial. She's the lead investigator on the Look Ahead trial. And so I went to Dr. Wing and, and she said, you know, I've been watching what you've been doing and let's study this and let's find out if it's actually doing what we say it's doing. And so we started to do research together. I'll never forget one day she called me into her office and she said, Rajiv, I have to tell you something. And I said, okay, what's, what's up? And she said, I want you to know that you're very spoiled. <laughs> and I said, all right, you know, what did I do wrong? Um, and, you know, I think my parents have probably spoiled me, but how did Dr. Wing find out? So, uh, you know, I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you know that most research on weight loss is done on populations of 30 or 40 people. And right now we're looking at a data set of 7,000 people. She said, this is unheard of. This is an amazing data set. Not only that, but the results are pretty remarkable. And it turns out that the results were pretty remarkable. Dr. Wing and I and her team have, have together published five peer-reviewed studies. And what we found is that people are losing clinically significant amounts of weight across the entire population. We're moving the needle, shifting people from being obese to being overweight, from being overweight to being healthy weight. But not only that, they're keeping the weight off months after the program because they're modifying their social network and their social environment so that it's conducive to maintaining that weight change over time. And then we went one step further and we said, okay, people are losing weight, but what does that mean for the social network? And it turns out that when we did social network analysis, we found out that that weight loss was contagious. And when one person in the program loses weight, the people around them on their team are much more likely to lose weight. And in fact, the weight loss happens in clusters. And we published the first ever study of its kind last month showing that weight loss in the proper intervention that leverages social effects uh, can actually be contagious. And the reason why that was so powerful is, it turns out that Dr. Nicholas Christakis from Harvard was right. Dr. Christakis several years ago showed us these famous charts um, from the Framingham Obesity Study where he looked at the past 30 years and showed us that over the past 30 years together as Americans we were making each other fat and we were spreading obesity from person to person and if your friend became obese you were 171% more likely to become obese during that period of time. And what Dr. Christakis said was that health is social because the behaviors that lead to health are social. And even though we were making each other fat over the past 30 years, if we can actually harness the social phenomenon, we can leverage the network effect and we can actually spread healthy behaviors. We published studies showing that exercise is contagious and weight loss is contagious. 
And so it's true that if we change social norms and we modify the environment, we can actually see a future that's not full of diabetic children. We can see a future where we get back on track, where generation after generation are living longer lives than their parents are. And so the story started off with, with my white coat ceremony. And you might be asking, how did it end? Um, I ended up taking uh, two and a half years off from medical school. And uh, with my classmate, Dr. Brad Weinberg, uh, we went out and we decided to run with this idea and scale it beyond what I want prove this model, but how can we get it out to more people? And so Brad and I and a whole host of other people, some of whom are in the audience today, um, went out and we raised capital, uh, close to $10 million. And we started to proselytize this idea. Um, and, and the program has grown to the point where uh, it's now offered in 16 languages across 93 countries and covering 2 million people all around the world. And after two and a half years, uh, and two and a half years of sleepless nights uh, for my mother, uh, I decided that I would do her a favor and finally finish my, my medical degree. I went back to school, and, um, and then I was faced with a choice. As a late third year, early fourth year student, you know, was I going to go and, and practice clinical medicine and do a residency, or did I want to pursue this idea? And I decided that I was so passionate about this idea that uh, we can leverage social connections to solve some of the greatest health challenges that we face, that I decided to use the company as a vehicle to start to shift the focus of our healthcare system from a sickness system to a wellness system. And so I did that. And, and what I'm not, saying, I'm not saying to all of you who are medical students or undergraduate students that you should drop out of school. Uh, if you're on track, you should do a residency. You should absolutely do it. I'm not telling you not to do that. Uh, what I am telling you is that whatever you do, if you're in the healthcare space, think about how the greatest health problems that we face are going to be solved. And realize that they're going to be solved not from a top-down solution in a top-down fashion. They're going to be solved from a bottom-up fashion. And whether you're the CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island or the dean of the medical school, the president of Rhode Island Hospital, whether you're a professor of family medicine, whether you're a medical student, a pre-med student, all of us need to think about this idea of a social approach to healthcare because it's coming at us faster than you can imagine. It's not just shape up that's working on this. Um, you may have heard of a website like Patients Like Me where people are tracking rare and chronic diseases, and they're working together not only to support each other, but to create a vast database of biometric data that can be harnessed uh, to look for clinical insights. You may have heard of Saddleback Church and Pastor Rick Warren, who took his thousands of Bible study groups and turned them into health improvement groups. And you have these people who are working together to help each other uh, lose weight and manage their diet. Uh, maybe you're downloading applications like the eatery on your iPhone, where you're taking pictures of your food and asking your friends to rate how healthy it is. Or maybe you're using a device like I do, like the Fitbit, or the We Things Weight Scale, where you're actually tracking your physical activity and your weight, posting it to your social network and asking the people around you to hold you accountable and to cheer you on. The truth is that it's not going to be a magic drug or a special surgery uh, or some federal policy that's going to solve our obesity epidemic. The, the solution is going to come from the crowd. It's going to come when we join hands, uh, when we support each other, when we work together uh, to help each other achieve these goals. Because the truth is that social problems require social solutions. And at the end of the day, we really have no choice. This is how uh, we're going to have to solve the problem. Otherwise, we're going to face what uh, Ben Franklin said, which is, uh, we must all hang together, or surely we shall all hang separately. Thank you.